Okay, our next speaker is John Hart, who has uh, recently uh, promoted uh, in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, John uh, makes all sorts of types of equipment, uh, growing different types of nanotubes, nanocarbons, fascinating laboratory. I've had the, the pleasure of, of, of kind of perusing through it. Uh, and he's also developed uh, ways to really scale printable electronics through novel printing methods, which I believe you're going to tell us about yes. today, John. Yes, thank you for the introduction, and uh, it's a, an honor to, to be uh, among uh, uh, such a distinguished group of speakers and to, to present our, our work to you. Uh, do you know if the video signal is, is projecting? It was working when I plugged in before. There we go. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, I like to describe my work as the interface of advanced materials, manufacturing process principles, and mechanical design. And the main focus today is a process we've been uh, developing uh, to uh, accelerate uh, the printing of electronic materials. And so uh, this is a snapshot from uh, the process that I'll describe. This is a stamp uh, made out of engineered nanomaterials that holds a, an ink made out of nanomaterials, and it's transferring ink in a very controlled fashion to a plastic film on this roller. And this work is done by uh, mainly these three guys in my group, uh, Sanha, Danush, and Hangbo, and our collaborators on campus. And uh, they're really the stars of the presentation. Uh, and in addition to doing research in this area, I teach courses on manufacturing and mechanical engineering, and I'm always in awe of the sophistication of stuff that factories brings us. And uh, you know, from uh, uh, developing to developed markets, uh, often to bring products to those markets and solve problems, we need to think about manufacturing at scale. And if you look at the devices that will bring uh, us, us the data that we're talking about gathering with our new kinds of sensors, we realize uh, the immense number of process technologies involved and the fact that it's often innovations in those processes processes that are key to that translation. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, how do I fabricate electronic devices, I'm not making the argument that we want to replace silicon-based electronics or some of the sophisticated architectures we've uh, heard of earlier today. I want to make the argument that we need new, lower-cost manufacturing technologies to create electronic and sensing devices in new formats. And about three years ago, we started looking at the fundamentals of ink transfer and printing processes, and perhaps the simplest process you could think of to transfer material from one substrate to the next, i.e. a stamp to something that you want to print the image on, is what we've come to call relief printing or flexography. It was invented by the Chinese about 2,000 years ago when they first did image printing using wood stamps. Uh, about 500 years ago, Gutenberg's invention of the printing press and particularly movable type, a reproducible process for making interchangeable characters, uh, led to the mass production of books, which was an innovation in, uh, in, in education and information transfer. And for about 100 years since we've been making engineered polymers, we've been doing rubber stamp printing. And certainly we print fewer things than we did several years ago because we communicate digitally but uh, still uh, graphics printing and the graphics that you're holding and are around uh, us in the room uh, is an important industry and an important technology. And the goal of printing materials roll to roll is to really create information at large scale. And our question is, how do we make this uh, active information, information that can gather and communicate uh, other information? Uh, and uh, this leads to the area of what we call printed electronics, a uh, uh, quite rapidly growing industry around the world where the goal is to take specialty inks, engineered nanomaterials in some cases, whether they be nanotubes or nanoparticles with certain properties and functionalities, conductive, semiconducting, dielectric, and liaise them through conventional printing technologies to create new formats of devices. And these are examples from around the world, thinking about displays in new formats, uh, organic photovoltaics and lighting, uh, three-dimensional touch interfaces and lighting for the automobile industry and already some commercial examples of what we call smart labels. So uh, putting sensors on product packaging or uh, enabling interactivity or authentication of products. And one of the important uh, needs for advancement of these technologies is improved manufacturing of fine scale features and uh, a cost reduction that go comes from the intrinsic attributes and scalability of the printing process. Well, the process we focused on is what's called flexography, relief printing that I showed you a moment ago. And in a bit more detail, relief printing is operated in a continuous fashion by basically transferring ink from one roll to the next. And you have an elastic printing plate, basically a cylindrical stamp, that transfers ink to your target substrate, paper, or plastic. And here's a video of a roll-to-roll -roll printing press. This is based at Clemson University, and it just gives you a sense of the speed at which you need to operate to enter the conversation. Arguably, meter per second ink transfer rate, and you can talk, talk about making things of use 
useful areas, say square centimeters approximately at, uh, at, at, at small fractions of a dollar. And if you look at surveys from uh, the printed electronics industry, uh, you see there's a, a sort of a white space in the attainment of fine resolution, uh, resolution of features that's uh, 10 microns or less with uh, high throughput, throughput approaching meters per second. And that's the address, the, 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 the gap we're trying to address. And there's a lot of technology used for printing flexography, screen printing, inkjet printing, xerography, which you may be familiar with. And for their own reasons, they have their own applications and strengths and weaknesses, but printing micron scale features is an important challenge. Uh, and in more detail, the idea is that you, uh, you ideally want to create a, a very thin uniform feature uh, that, that you print onto your target substrate such as a plastic foil. And in reality, fluid mechanics uh, limit the situation that you can, you, can, you can enter in terms of the smallest feature size. And without going into the details, you can have the case where you uh, put too little ink on the surface and you have dewetting and you have incomplete patent transfer, or you put too much ink on the surface of your stamp and you have excessive spreading and you push out the feature to be fatter than it needs to be. Uh, because you have uh, too much pressure at play. And it's easy to make rubber stamps that are smaller. That's not the limit to miniaturization, but the limit to miniaturization is the uh, fluid mechanics at the contact interface. Uh, so what we've invented is a new stamp material based on our expertise in producing uh, nanostructures, and we call it uh, a flexography using nanoporous stamps. And the basic idea is instead of having a solid rubber stamp, you have a nanoporous stamp that controls the con transfer of ink at a finer length scale. And we make this out of carbon nanotubes. Uh, we make them out of micro-pattern carbon nanotubes that we call forest. And so each uh, pixel, if you will, of the image you want to print or each line of the uh, antenna you want to print is an array of nanotubes that holds ink within its volume. Uh, and therefore, if you look closely at this cartoon of the interface between the stamp feature and the substrate, you have a bunch of nanotubes each holding uh, ink and therefore transferring small volumes of ink to your substrate. So if you get the contact mechanics right and the mechanics of the stamp, you can print ultra-thin ink layers. And here's an example of a simple pattern, just an array of rectangular dots to show possibility rather than application. And here's one microstructure, one pixel in the stamp, 20 microns on a side. Uh, and here's a printed ink square from that same stamp feature. And you can see that uh, 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 unlike inkjet printing where you'd print relatively circular features, you can print square features because you transfer the ink directly with all these small contact points. And an attribute of our process is because we control the contact mechanics at this nanoscale interface, you can print fairly thin and uniform features. So this is after drying of the ink, which is actually, in this case, silver nanoparticles in a solvent. You can have uniform features. This is a, a, a probe microscope uh, scan uh, of, say, 15 nanometers in diameter. And I'll show later how you can control this thickness. Uh, and our ability to do this actually comes from a long uh, 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 period of effort in our group on uh, growth of carbon nanotubes. Uh, and uh, we grow what we call forests of nanotubes on substrates. This is a video in real time, uh, uh, accelerated 50x in a transmission electron microscope. We're actually looking at the nanotubes growing toward us at high temperature. And it shows the nanotubes self-organizing into this porous forest. Uh, we call it a forest because it's like many nanoscale trees kind of waving in contact with one another. And it's our expertise in the growth of this material that gave us the idea to apply it to printing technology. And it's an interesting nanostructured material because it uh, has a relatively large volume. You can grow these from many microns to millimeters tall, uh, effectively way beyond uh, the height of this building. And they're nanoporous and have some structural resilience. And we grow these on silicon wafers. And you can pattern the catalyst, the seeds for growth, and therefore dictate the shape of features. So this uh, expertise in growing nanomaterials led us to be able to produce stamps with the level of control that work in this application. When it comes to producing the stamps to be functional uh, uh, in printing inks, you need to do a few other things. Uh, you, you need to uh, uh, grow the CNTs, you need to etch the top surface to make the surface soft, and you need to coat the CNTs with a polymer to promote the wettability of the ink. And the bottom line of this slide is that after we apply a series of treatments to the stamp, we can actually have features that retain the ink that are nanoporous and don't shrink upon drying of the ink. So we're able to create these liquid stable nanoporous surfaces, and by doing mechanical characterization, of the surface, we learned that we needed to make the surface of the stamp soft just like the bulk of the stamp. So when we press it against the substrate upon which we, we print, it's soft enough when we get enough of those nanoscale tips uh, that transfer the ink to be in contact. And that's necessary for printing of a uniform image. The simplest thing that one can print 
uh, is uh, an array of lines. So if you want to test if you print something electrically functional, you can take a stamp that's a, an array of lines of nanotubes processed as I described, and you uh, load the stamp with a silver ink, silver nanoparticle ink, and you print an array of lines, and then you anneal the material to produce a conductive feature, because you need to go from the uh, printed nanoparticles to conductive line features. Uh, and basically, you get a, a trace that is uh, a fraction of the conductivity of bulk silver. If you look up the conductivity of bulk silver in a textbook, we can get about 60% uh, if we anneal the printed feature. And that's pretty good when it comes to uh, printed electronic uh, features. Uh, a, a further aspect of our research has been understanding the mechanism of these nanoscale contact mechanics. And uh, for example, we can develop a model that uh, considers the top surface of this nanostructured stamp as having a distribution of heights of the individual nanotubes. So in an ideal fashion, these are the individual CNTs, and this is representing the ink that's captured by the CNTs. And here's actually a top view of a stamp that we call a honeycomb stamp, which is basically a, a uniform film with an array of holes, and you uh, can get a sense of all the tips here that would be transferring the ink to your substrate upon which you print. And the idea is that you load the nanotube stamp with ink by capillarity. You apply the ink, and the ink wets into the volume of the CNT forest, each, each pillar here being, for example, one of these areas. And then you press it in contact onto your plastic foil, and you need to apply enough pressure for enough of the CNTs to be in contact. And we've been able to do experiments to identify the pressure that needs to be applied to get good printing. And the idea is that if your pressure is too low, only some of the nanotubes are in contact, so you transfer an incomplete image. You want to print this square, but instead of printing a square, you print only the outside and some areas in the middle. Uh, and if you print, apply too much pressure, uh, you have the same problem as I showed in the case of the rubber stamp. Your feature that's printed is too large, and your liquid spreads outside. But you have a fairly uh, a general a region of about a factor of 10 where you can apply and just enough pressure to get a good feature, and you can print these features with uh, uh, different, uh, different dimensions and different shapes in the same go. Uh, and uh, it's been a further goal of our research to demonstrate that this process can be, can be implemented at uh, 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 rates that are important for industrial use. You know, we can't build a full uh, production system in our lab. That's not our job. But uh, we've built a small system that lets us show that we can transfer ink at a rate of, so far, limited by the speed of the motor that we have, about 0.2 meters per second. So this system operates by coordinated rotary linear motion of this roller. And you'll see it going back and forth in this video uh, over uh, a substrate where we have our stamp that's cut out uh, from the way we fabricate it on basically a precision spring where we can control the force and measure the displacement. So this provides a development platform for us to show that you can print various devices in a semi-continuous fashion where eventually we would envision this being deployed into a roll-to-roll -roll machine. And we think that the machine technology exists, the expertise such as the machines I showed you before, but it's the novelty of this stamp material that will let finer features be achieved in the future. Uh, a further basic example is printing uh, transparent electrodes. So uh, transparent conductive films are actually quite a large market, and there's need for improvements due to performance and scarcity of indium. That's the material used now. And we can simply print conductive grids using our engineered nanopore stamps, where this is the stamp pattern. This is a printed honeycomb electrode that comes after printing. Uh, and we can get uh, materials that are fairly transparent, in fact, as transparent or better than other ex existing alternatives, including the ITO electrodes that are are uh, used in all of your smartphones and touchscreen devices. So uh, our vision is to think about uh, what uh, we can uh, do to contribute to uh, an era of fully printed electronics. And these are examples from various publications, not any of our own work. But uh, we believe the idea of printing fine features uh, rapidly and uh, expanding the library of printed materials to functional nanomaterials uh, is important for the growth of this industry. And across uh, many great academic demonstrations, there's a limitation in scalability and also a limitation in feature size. And if you know uh, about electronics, electronic devices and what drives the performance and cost uh, and power consumption of things like printed transistors or the resolution of ultra high resolution displays, you may realize that uh, dimensional uh, attributes such as feature size and uniformity of thickness are certainly key. Uh, and we've also shown recently that we can expand this printing technology to a variety of commercially available colloidal materials, not only uh, silver inks, but also uh, semiconducting quantum dot inks and various uh, dielectric uh, inks. And here are just some pictures of various features that we printed using the patterns that we have in the lab, uh, various colors and various combinations of sizes and shapes. And from a, print, a manufacturing point of view, this is not a pattern for a particular device, but it shows uh, unique capability and the ability to print narrow and wide features and sharp and rounded features in the same go, which you couldn't do with inkjet printing and other capabilities.
So uh, where we stand in this process now, if you look at the chart that industry cares about, sort of feature size versus throughput, is we've shown that we can, uh, in the lab, exceed the resolution of existing flexographic processes by about a factor of 10. We're down to printing features of, say, three or four microns in width, uh, and we're entrenching upon this white space that the industry has established. Now, this chart that uh, we put together also includes a lot of finer resolution printing technologies demonstrated at the lab scale, but not scalable to the appropriate speed. So uh, tip-based technologies are useful for prototyping small devices, but not for entering the realm of industry. And another a metric we believe is important is the amount of ink that you transfer per unit length, basically a unit of normalized thickness. And here not only is what industry has achieved, but the uh, research papers published by other groups, and we think our approach to transfer thin layers of ink is uh, encroaching upon uh, a fidelity of material transfer that has not been entertained before. Uh, so uh, as you can tell, this work is still at an early stage, and there are many challenges for scalability. But as we advance some of our own ideas for devices that we're developing now, would be really excited to hear about particular applications that you have in mind. Uh, and before I close, I just want to show a couple of other examples of uh, work that we're doing that I think might relate to the broader uh, capabilities uh, that we hope to advance at MIT in the future. Uh, the first is the use of carbon nanotubes for uh, novel kinds of synthetic surfaces. Uh, and we've seen a lot of great examples of how uh, our colleagues are making devices that respond to you know, light uh, or, uh, or chemical uh, signals. Uh, there's also the need for devices that can respond to very sensitive uh, touch or mechanical signals. Uh, and here's an example by collaboration with uh, our colleagues uh, Kripa Varanasi and his students, we've been studying the mechanism by which butterfly wings uh, uh, attract and repel droplets. Basically, if you look closely at a butterfly wing in an electron microscope, you see that it comprises all these fine, beautifully intricate, colorful microscopic scales. And if you look at a droplet of water being scrubbed back and forth on the surface, you can see that the, 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 the scales are actually deflecting mechanically. They get pulled back and forth by about you know, 45 to 60 degrees by the uh, pinning force exerted by the liquid droplet. And uh, given our expertise in, in, in making carbon nanotube surfaces, we've developed a process to grow these curved microscales, we call them, and texture them such that they can have enhanced adhesion to the liquid droplets and build a synthetic surface that can interact with droplets in a similar way. And this, uh, for us, is a, a, a nice demonstration in kind of biomimicry and understanding the mechanism by which this uh, synthetic, this natural surface interacts with liquids, but also a way that we could think of capturing the unique properties of these materials, the nanotube are conductive and their stiffness can be engineered and they could perhaps transduce electrical signals to interact with the physical world in a new way. And another uh, uh, idea that was inspired by this that we're working on now is thinking of controlling the adhesion for applications and picking and placing very small uh, components of electronic devices or even for large-scale robotic grippers. Uh, and uh, last, as, as Tim alluded to in the introduction, uh, we also take pride in our interest in making machinery uh, and understanding the, pro the principles of processes at scale. So one of our efforts is on manufacturing of 2D materials at scale, 2D materials such as graphene, and so we've built a roll-to-roll -roll CBD system that can produce uh, continuous lengths of graphene on metal foils in our lab. And our focus here is uh, with our collaborators, uh, Professor Rohit Karnick and his group, uh, in demonstrating a full end-to-end roll-to-roll compatible process for making advanced membranes out of graphene. And would also be very excited if we were able to provide tools like this to MIT Nano so we can help bridge the gap to scalability in the marketplace. And I'm also very excited about the potential for uh, additive manufacturing, aka 3D printing technologies, to uh, think about producing things in new ways with new capabilities and also truly on-demand production. Uh, and uh, we've recently taken the idea of uh, the most versatile 3D printer, which is a desktop polymer 3D printer that uses extrusion. And by studying its rate-limiting mechanisms, we've basically developed a desktop system that can print uh, 10 times faster. So you could have a small object, whether it be an object for a mechanical system or to repair a refrigerator or perhaps to go in your car or to treat a patient in an emergency situation in a span that it's reasonable to weight. Uh, and I think the idea of producing uh, components in small quantities and producing components in small de uh, in, uh, on demand is a really a new way to think about uh, design and manufacturing in the future and can perhaps play some important uh, uh, synergies with uh, advanced electronics and sensing technologies as well. Uh, and that's where I'll conclude. I want to thank my research group uh, gathered here around the really cool sculpture in the new wing of the math building, uh, Building 2 at MIT, and thank our funding sources and the rest of the team.
Thank you, John. Actually, part of his, John's uh, presentation reminds me that in MIT Nano, you're not, it's not going to just be the off-the-shelf tools. I mean, we'll have state-of-the-art fabrication equipment, but there will be many new generations of tools that will be, uh, that will be fielded there through different individual researchers like people like John Hart who are developing next generation of nanofab uh, 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 systems.